Welcome back to Flagship Studio. Our next conversation is a future cast dialogue between our founder and CEO, Nubar Afayan, and former chairman and CEO of J&J, &J, Alex Gorski. Nubar, Alex, to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank Thanks you for doing this. All right, sorry for being starting this late for those of you online. As you've probably heard, there are torrential rains in San Francisco. I heard it's balmy and sunny in Boston. I don't know why we're doing this out here, but anyway, here we are, <laughs> suffering through the troubles of biotech. Anyway, um, so the, thanks, for, thanks for giving us your time, Alex. I want to start out, obviously, this is the first uh, JPMs uh, kind of in person since the pandemic, and the pandemic has affected just about everything. And you had a very particular role and position within the pandemic, leading one of the major companies in the healthcare sector, uh, both working on the pandemic, but also impacted by the pandemic. And I'd love to know how this last period of leadership uh, in this type of unexpected environment kind of uh, felt and, and what, what, what impressions and, and, and lessons you took away from that. Sure. Well, first of all, Nubar, it's just great to be here. Thanks for having me, for running through the rain to be here. Uh, and like in many of you in the audience, how awesome is it that we're actually back together again? Uh, you know, and, and look, I think it's, I'm very, I'm so proud of our industry. Uh, if you think about it, uh, what the world experienced over the last three years really hasn't been experienced for likely more than a century. And to see our industry come together and rally and make a difference for the world, I think is a really very proud moment. And, uh, and I know just myself yesterday, I don't know how many of those one-on-one -on -one drive by meetings I had, and I think I had three dinners and you know, a couple lunches, uh, the, the typical routine. And uh, it was just great to be proximate, to be close uh, to our colleagues again. And you know, you're, you're right, as, as I reflect back on the pandemic, if you would have asked me like 40 years ago, and, and I was out here in 1982, 83, the last time they had rains like this. And I remember being a young you know, lieutenant in the Army at that time. If you would have said, 40 years later, you're going to be CEO of one of the largest healthcare company in the middle of one of the biggest pandemics that we've ever faced, and oh, by the way, you're in a hunt for a vaccine, I would have said, are you freaking crazy? And to, so to be in that moment, um, I'm glad it was near the end of my tenure as a CEO. Uh, I think you know, having that experience uh, and the insight and the kind of relationships was really helpful. But you know, more than anything else, Numa, I think you'd agree, I think it showed like, fundamentally the power of science and technology. If we had not invested literally billions of dollars over many years with twists and turns, some things worked, some things didn't, I don't think any of us would have been in the position that we were in. I think it took a ton of partnerships um, with the government, with other pharma companies, uh, with so many different entities, not only to do the development part and discovery, but also to do the access piece, to do the actual distribution. And I think lastly for me, just seeing people respond in our organization. I mean, ultimately, these were moms and dads who were our researchers who were working 24 seven to make that happen. And you know, they had children at home, they had their parents, some of whom had COVID, and they were still working 24 seven, virtually in a very you know, um, high anxiety, you know, stressful situation. And I couldn't be more proud of the way that mm -hmm. they delivered. And, and frankly, other companies, be it Moderna, Pfizer, and you know, produce the therapeutics along the way. Uh, again, I think it was a really special time for the mm -hmm. industry. Super. So then if we just take the, pa the pandemic facing part of the effort out, you also had a, another small business to run, which is the rest of J&J, &J, yeah. which was obviously inundated with the challenges of the pandemic. How did that kind of test your leadership? And how, like, you don't know how long it's going to last. You don't know what supply chains are going to get impacted. You don't know which trials are going to get stopped. On and on, you were making changes to your, your strategy in the consumer business. So how, does, how was leadership of the rest, even while this exciting part was a battle, how, how did you think about all that? Yeah, you, you know, you're right. Uh, I'll, I remember the day like it was yesterday. First one, Paul Stoffels, who, of course, the 
iconic research and development leader that I had the privilege to work with at J&J for so many years, came with a team of our researchers, an epidemiologist in the infectious disease group and said, this is serious, this is going to be different. And immediately starting thinking, okay, what were our priorities? Um, Johnson Johnson, on any given day, I think we send out about 335,000 line items of product. And up to 75%, for example, the products that are used in a surgical procedure can be our products in an OR suite. And if we could not continue to, again, develop, manufacture, distribute, the impact that that would have on healthcare systems around the world would be significant. So mission one for us, before we even talked about the vaccine, was we've got to make sure that we've got the kind of resiliency, the redundancy in place to keep that flowing. And it was on a global basis. And again, what was remarkable when airplanes stopped around the world, in the, what a lot of people don't know, in the belly of a lot of those airplanes that carry people, there's a lot of goods in, that get transferred around the world as well. So we had to come up with alternatives to make sure that things like suture, things like hemostats, things like you know, prosthetic, other you know, um, uh, medical products, could be, let alone drugs. People couldn't discontinue therapy if you were being treated for multiple myeloma, the implications and the consequences. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we tried to do is make sure that our business leaders stayed maniacally focused on exactly that. You know, working with their teams, again, their supply chains, other people, even with policy, because of course we ran into borders were being closed. So we had to, for, and we, we had globally distributed supply chains. So we had to navigate our way through some of those issues. Uh, but mission one was to keep those products flowing so that frankly hospitals could have the products that they needed to support patients around the world. I think the next thing that, and this was something that I've, I've learned along the way in leadership is that it's important to have very focused, dedicated, and accountable teams whenever you're doing something of great significance. Otherwise, you just end up diluting people's efforts. In this case, we kind of took a tiger team approach with our vaccine group, uh, where they were going to be 100% dedicated. They had, again, very a clear prioritization of resources, of what they needed, constant check-ins. And again, what I'm really proud of is that we were doing much of this virtually, you know, at the same time, uh, but making sure that they got the resources, um, empowering them, uh, making sure that, you know, we were removing obstacles. You know, there's a natural dynamic in a big organization, it's gra called gravity. <laughs> things just settle in. And so if you're not constantly fighting that to remove those things, it becomes an encumbrance. And of course, when you're trying to do something that we thought could have an impact for the world, we needed to make sure that that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. Just to stay on this one, one more aspect of it. So we're in an industry, and I'm speaking now about the pharmaceutical side particularly, uh, we're in an industry of probabilities. Every, I feel like every morning we wake up and we start calculating probabilities. So uh, in, an, in a backdrop where all the programs and pipeline you had are all about preclinical probabilities, phase one probabilities, you know, lung cancers, different probabilities, all these probabilities, uh, most low in the beginning and increasing over time. How, how does working on a, a vac discovering a vaccine, the probability of that, developing it, testing it, and launching it in a time frame that's a fraction of time fit into a probability mindset? And if it doesn't, what does that do to the probability mindset that now everybody wants to go back to? Given that this was, you know, it can't be that AZ, J&J, &J, Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna, all develop essentially effective to various extents vaccines, and yet we go back to a probability-based industry that says, well, no, actually, most of the time it's not going to work. Oh, no, and, and look, I, I found your, um, your article quite interesting in, about this dynamic of risk and uncertainty, and how do we need to think about that? And as I'm sure you've sat through many meetings where if you try to distill your entire portfolio down to math, uh, I think you're missing really um, critical decision points. And, and, and let me explain. I think, you know, one is, and I alluded to this earlier, we would never have been in the place that we were in had we not already done a tremendous amount of research. For example, on our platform, the Adback 26, where it had already been deployed and used with Ebola in Africa. 
Uh, and you know, we had looked at it in many other areas. So there was actually a fair amount of knowledge and data that gave us the confidence early on that you know, we could take the genomic information coming out about COVID-19 to re-engineer it to be prepared. And you know, of, of course, there's risk associated with it whenever you take things to that scale. Uh, you, know, you suddenly go from a smaller population to a larger population. But I think that's where it really boils down to world-class scientists uh, with deep expertise. And, and I think that's something that people don't always fully appreciate in our industry. And to do this right, there are literally, and these scientists have dedicated their lives to very specific areas. And during times like this, having those kind of experts um, was absolutely critical. I think the second piece for us was we found, especially during this period of discovery and, and development, um, some of the new data and analytic tools were absolutely critical. You know, for example, what a lot of people didn't understand, and I'm sure you may have experienced it somewhat at Moderna, and I think all the companies did, was the virus was moving so quickly that you actually needed sites where inf infection rates were higher than the norm mm -hmm. so that you could actually do the clinical trial. And we were trying to predict where that virus was going to go. And, and so employing tools in a clinical mm -hmm. trial setting, we had never operated quite in that way. And again, that was a way of us of trying to apply better, better tools to get to this issue so that you know, ultimately we get the data. So yeah. it, it's my hope, frankly, that we take many of those tools forward. I think that the data and analytics side of things hold tremendous progress for us to do uh, a much better job, not only in better characterizing efficacy and safety, but also just a better predicting outcomes, better predicting patient populations who are likely to respond. I think it can be an extraordinarily powerful tool going forward. Cool. So then, uh, just to kind of zoom out a little bit, obviously the last two years were the capstone of a, a very successful career, and you've you know run a, an incredibly large, successful organization. Away from the pandemic, are there a few things that you have taken away about leadership that, let's say, either you've discovered or you've doubled down on and it's actually uh, proved to be effective that you can share with us? Oh, so many lessons, you know, learned through, throughout my career, um, you know, let alone during my time as you know, CEO and, uh, and chair, and particularly as it relates to innovation. Um, you know, a few that I would say is I think you know, one is ultimately it's so important for leadership to prioritize a constant uh, and diligent pursuit of the very best science and technology. And you know, you can always get caught up in a crisis du jour, and you can be drowned in the operational issues of the day. Uh, but if we're not always innovating, if we're not always thinking about that next generation product or service that's gonna make a difference for patients uh, or for public health systems, we're not doing our job. And, and, and leaders shouldn't underestimate the impact that little actions can have. Where do you spend your time? What questions do you ask? Uh, who do you recognize in an organization? Uh, you know, a classic example of sales versus discovery uh, and, and development outcomes. And I think um, setting the right tone mm -hmm. is critical. Um, I think too, it's about empowerment, making sure that people have the resources, understanding that there are gonna be failures, that things aren't always going to work out. Um, and, but supporting people through all that uh, it, that's where I found breakthroughs always happen. I think another really important component for us has been partnerships and collaboration. And science rarely happens today where you have like the single scientist or person who suddenly has that, you know, aha epiphany moment. Mm -hmm. It is usually the result of teams pulling together disparate pieces of data and being able to connect dots and, and bring that together and, um, and understanding that um, you, you've got to really be agnostic about where you're sourcing or, um, innovation from. It can be external, it can be internal. 
but ultimately, it's about finding that best science and supporting it. Super. So, um, you know, ever since technology has been around and healthcare has been around, technology was about to revolutionize healthcare. So it's been decades at this conference. That's, but it's now 2023, and we can kind of look at yet again the issue of technology and healthcare intersecting. How do you view the next period as it relates to what's going to be uh, possible and enabled by the rapid deployment of technologies across the spectrum of the uh, healthcare world, whether it's discovery or development or the, the, the delivery of care? Look, I, am, I couldn't be more excited. Um, if somebody who's been in the industry for 35 years uh, and have seen a lot of trends, I do think this is a different kind of tipping point as it relates to the acceleration. And, and by the way, that, and that's not only the biopharma sciences, mm -hmm. but that is also medical technology. That's things on the care and the delivery side. Um, and, um, but it, I think there are certain caveats, which I'll come back to, that we need to be reflective of. And look, some of this, you probably remember, um, what was it, 25 years ago when we first thought combinatorial chemistry and high throughput mm -hmm. screening was going to be like the next path forward. And that didn't quite pan out the way that we thought. Mm -hmm. I do think this period is different. Uh, much of it lies related to digitization, to the, frankly, the, the power that we have now to just harness huge amounts of data and information that we didn't have before. And I think that's changing the way we discover and we think about drugs, all the evidence by the, you know, the, all the new cell-based technologies that we have now. And, and going from this construct of, okay, how are we going to go in and change that or turn that one receptor site off and on to, no, we're gonna actually re-engineer the software, uh, opens up so much more in the way of possibilities to move maybe from just palliative care to potentially cures. And I think that's incredibly exciting. Um, I see it in medical technology, uh, taking many of the same tools that, it's interesting, you can go around San Francisco here at this meeting, have you guys seen some of the driverless cars going around with you know all the gear on them? Applying that to surgery. I mean, surgery's been basically perform the same way for the last hundred years. And it can be, you know, pretty gruesome and incredibly dependent on the hands of that one particular surgeon as, you know, as well as the tools in their hands. But being able to apply some of these next generation technologies, I think could lead to radical transformation about the way we see that care, let alone the way that we interact as patients and the roles of patients and consumers now. So I think this is a tipping point, but I, I also would caution all of industry and frankly, everyone in healthcare, that we need to be careful not to overpromise and underdeliver. Not all of these things are going to work. There's gonna be twists and turns. We're gonna learn things along the way. We need to be thoughtful about balancing risk in some of these in, in the right way. Don't forget, even while some of the technology can be really cool, really sexy, that the patient needs to be in the middle of all this uh, and that we're thoughtful. And, and some things won't work out. But if I add all that up, I think the next 10 years will be more exciting than the last 30. Super. And then on that front, <clears throat> one of the things J&J &J, <clears throat> several years ago, uh, and for many years already it's been doing, has been talking about kind of a real long-term vision of a world without disease. And the, and the focus being on how can we actually prevent the onset of disease. With the, those thinking of the work that's happened, how do you think about where that may head? How do you think about kind of the, the fact that we're largely calling healthcare what's really sick care? And we haven't yet started working on actually healthcare using the science, et cetera. I know J&J &J really uniquely from the large company standpoint uh, was way ahead in that. Now that you've studied this space and tried things, what's your view of all that? Yeah, you know, look, I was fortunate to be at a company where we have a long tradition of um, really trying to think about employee wellness and prevention before those were even in the vernacular, vernacular in a big way. And, um, and when we combine that history at J&J &J in terms of some of the things we were trying to do with employees, 
with an aspiration, and I have to give credit to Dr. Bill Height, mm -hmm. uh, working with Paul Stoffels and their group, you know, as part of a kind of a strategic planning session we had years ago, where they were th you know, trying to think, okay, what's the next decade going to be like across our R&D teams? They said, well, can we think of a world without disease? Can we think of a period where we actually prevent these things from happening in the first place? And I think many of us in this room or in this field recognize that in most cases, we just get to things way too late. And, and so at, J at Johnson & Johnson, the way we try to think about it is, look, let's first of all, how can we keep people well? And how do we keep people healthy is unfortunately probably up to about 75% of the things that ultimately will take our life are really significantly impacted by our behaviors. And so it has to do with how we live our lives, how we eat, how we drink, how we sleep, how we rest, uh, you know, our emotional state. Um, and, and, and there are basically daily rituals that we can build into our lives. And it doesn't mean that you've got to go be a triathlete or you need to eat like a monk or you know, do certain things, but small changes can have huge impact over the long term within each one of those areas. And what we've tried to do is make sure that we provide the kind of education, the kind of tools, the kind of support systems to employees and their families, ultimately to bring that to life. Um, and, and we think that's a great investment and, and we saw tremendous response, not only in terms of our own internal healthcare costs, but also in terms of employee engagement and how it made them feel about the way the company feels about them. So that was clearly one component. And I realized doing that at a national level can be challenging. We all know behavioral change is tough. Uh, and it touches on a lot of different aspects. But I think the more that we as a society, you know, a lot of people tell me, well, you know, what are some of the problems with healthcare? I said, well, healthcare is probably representative of many of the issues in society. And unless we don't address, address issues in society around disparities of care, you know, in care, uh, about end of life care, about making sure that our children are getting access to the right kinds of foods and activities and things like that, it's going to manifest itself in the healthcare system. These are societal issues. So, but that is one component. The other one related to our products and services was, okay, how do we get to these things earlier? Because whether it's Alzheimer's disease, whether it's uh, cancer, cardiovascular disease, we don't get to these things until it's probably the fourth quarter. And we know that if we get to it in the first quarter, our probability of success is so much higher. Uh, and, and so we put a lot of effort uh, into these areas. We've done things like the, our lung cancer initiative, for example, uh, where we're trying to work across our medical technology uh, and our therapeutics group mm -hmm. to say, okay, how do we better diagnose things earlier? How do we apply perhaps localized treatments as well as systemic treatments that overall can lead to better outcomes, really taking a holistic approach? So I'm excited about, you know, it's still, again, still a lot of work to do in those spaces, mm -hmm. uh, but clearly if we get to things earlier, we can have a better, mm -hmm. we think, long-term impact. Yeah, so we, you know, we, some, we work in these areas a little bit on the innovation side, and we kind of look at this as a trade-off between maximizing lifespan and max maximizing health span. And, and the kind of people don't have that choice today, so they right. kind of immediately assume that the goal is to maximize lifespan. But you, you mentioned about behavior. Um, interestingly, the, the, the tech companies obviously are, have gotten pretty good at modifying behavior by creating echo chambers and reinforcing a subset of the behaviors people have by surrounding them with people who affirm such behavior. Has that ever been focused on driving healthy behavior through social media? Not but by creating these echo chambers that might make people feel like that's the right subset of their behaviors they should. I mean, I'm just curious because you always hear about that for the bad, right. but now I'm sitting here thinking about this. And, and the reason I say that is it, 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 what's lacking, I think, is, the, is a business model, yeah. right? So I mean, like who, who can, who can generate returns for what's otherwise a major societal impact, I guess? Uh, and anyway, you bring up a couple of good points, and, and that's, a, that's a big package to unbundle. Mm. And, and I think, look, there's a technology side of that, but then there's also a business model, i.e. reimbursement, uh, 
model that's associated with that as well. So let's start with the first one. I think the technology certainly holds a lot of promise. I mean, we already know, for example, that whether it's social media, whether it's technology that we wear, uh, the amount of data that we can track now. And I think what's critical in what we're learning, it's not just about being able to track your steps, your heart rate, you know, your you know, sat level, all these other things, but how do you put that into digestible information that the patient, the consumer can understand and that helps them think about their behavior? And I think that is where we're going now. I think there's some really interesting things being done, for example, at Apple and other places that can help get to this issue. And, but again, I think it's, it's not just about giving people a, you know, a, a snippet of data, but it's trying to put that into, uh, again, information that they can relate to and that can lead to, you know, changes that they're going to have in their lives to, you know, again, lead to overall outcomes. Number two, it's, it's about our systems. And unfortunately, right now, we have a healthcare system that reimburses sick care and that in some cases can actually encourage it rather than help people stay healthy. And again, I realize it's, there's a lot of challenges associated with that, uh, but I think over time we need to evolve to those kind of systems to uh, lead to making the kind of changes that we're, mm -hmm. we're talking about. And, and you operate globally, and the healthcare systems are different globally. Has this initiative of trying to move upstream been deployed in a regional way where it should make more sense to the healthcare system? And for that matter, in the US, the regional play would be corporations who are self-insuring. I mean, do, is there hope in those arenas of saying, you know, we don't have to change everything, we just have to find some early adopters, and those are the early adopters may be in the UK or Scandinavia or what have you. What's, what's been the experience there? Look, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of good pilots that we've seen. Um, and, you know, I think what we've seen is pilots that work don't necessarily try to change the world, uh, but they tend to be very focused on you know specific patient populations, under um, you know with uh, very specific let's say use cases, you know versus trying to do too much, and um, and look I think this also could be a places where other places around the world that don't have such entrenched in interests across the system they may be able to actually make you know faster change uh, than you'd see in a system like the United States, but look I think. There's probably not one silver bullet. Mm -hmm. you know, I, think, it, I think we're going to have to innovate. I think we're going to have to pilot. Uh, but again, I remain optimistic mm -hmm. that we can make a difference in this area. Good. So just uh, want to come back to a little bit of discussion we had about, about risk, or you mentioned about risk. So uh, again, I know you're in diversified businesses, but I'm focusing on the life science kind of pharmaceutical side or related medical side. So I, I guess you'd agree that we are in a, in a kind of a, the business of science, right? Science drives the business. Right. And science is presumably deploying newfound knowledge to create better outcomes, right? Um, a corporation, the more successful it is, the more it has to value planable, predictable, consistent growth in profits. How is that compatible with the uncertainty that science has to kind of uh, uh, work in. So, so to what extent is the planning, the planning and predicting and setting goals overlay actually take companies out of the business of science? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, you know, at a high level, I respond to that saying, I don't think it's an either or proposition. I think it's gotta be an and and proposition mm -hmm. to be able to be successful long-term and in a sustainable way. And what I mean by that is, yes, it's incumbent for a large organization in particular to build the kind of operational, the executional excellence that can deliver, again, over long periods of time in very predictable and consistent ways. That's what our, our customers expect. And if we can't do that, then you know it, it, we're just not, uh, serving them, we're not, uh, we're not completing our mission. I think it's absolutely necessary. That being said, it's not sufficient. 
Because we also know if you're not constantly innovating and playing chess and thinking about, okay, what's that next generation? What could make my, what could ops, you know, uh, lead to obsolescence of the current product line? Or what could make a tremendous difference for patients on the road? Then we're also not doing our job. So I think it's a kind of dynamic tension in the organization that exists. And, and I've also seen it go the other way where you can't have uh, a endless array of science projects. Uh, in a company, if you don't have a certain discipline with milestones, uh, with uh, with check-ins uh, and accountabilities and responsibilities, then it becomes very difficult for you to be able to sustain that again over a long period of time. Uh, so we always thought about it about in terms of a balance, in that we especially as the company, the size, the scale, and the global nature of Johnson & Johnson, we have to deliver every day in a way that people expect. Uh, at the same time, you've got to be investing for the future, recognizing that there's likely going to be more uncertainty, and, and you have to develop the kind of leadership skills and organizational mindset that can carry those two, you know, that can seem very different philosophies you got to be able to do that all the time. Mm -hmm. Super. So we talked a little bit about the role of tech in healthcare, and I guess the, we're living at a time when the component of tech that is AI and machine learning is is particularly kind of new and 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 um, disruptive in in the positive sense of the word. It opens up new possibilities. Um, obviously, you have many different uh, purviews towards the, the development of AI and the various hats you wear. But what's your sense? about how machine learning AI impacts the stated J&J &J goal of kind of end-to-end -end innovation and kind of bringing data into everything that you're doing. <laughs> how do these things factor in together? Um, again, I, I think it holds tremendous promise. Um, and it, look, it's, it starts fundamentally with drug discovery. Uh, and the, the leaps and bounds that we're seeing right now occur because of our ability to put some of these tools to use, uh, where it's not just a matter of what I would call numbers by the number of molecules, for example, that you're going to run through a particular screening process, uh, but where you can actually use some of the AI to digitize th this information so that you're, again, you're fundamentally changing the nature of some of these um, you know, compounds. Uh, is what's enabling us to see such uh, breakthroughs and faster development and have much better predictability about the likely outcome associated with it. Mm -hmm. um, we see it, in, and I mentioned this earlier, in our clinical trials, being able to do those, being able to better target patient populations, you know, where you're going to see an effect or where you're going to see a, a side effect. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about its application, uh, again, in the surgical suite. I think it has tremendous promise there as we digitize things like anatomy uh, and other dynamics uh, that those tools have not been employed in a significant way. And I think over the next five or 10 years, you're gonna see that done. Uh, and, and again, that could relate to the way not only that we replace knees and hips and uh, perhaps spine, but it could also work on how we excise a tumor. You know, how do we improve the outcomes associated? How do we do a better job of um, you know, managing margins and th things of that nature. Uh, AI and ML are going to give us, I think, um, the kind of tools to do that in a much more accurate way. I'd say the, the third area that's exciting, frankly, is on the patient and consumer side. Um, and while, again, I think you have to be very careful about the overpromise. I think when it comes to things like certain primary care diagnoses, I think certain areas even in mental health, I think some of these tools could be extremely helpful as like kind of a first line so that we could actually improve access and perhaps even improve some of the accuracy of early diagnosis, particularly for primary care conditions. Super. So um, I'm just trying to probe different aspects of your life, which is many multifaceted. So being CEO of J&J &J is, you know, among the corporate leader roles that is as close to a head of state as it gets. You operate globally, you have to think about a very large uh, uh, employee base, and you get drawn into 
policy matters, regulatory reimbursement, lots of different spheres that you know most other CEOs are are thankfully not pulled into uh, because it usually exceeds their their experience and 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 kind of comes with a lot of responsibility. But you've been in that role and you've you've had to both be regulated and affect regulation, both be reimbursed and affect. How how have what now? Obviously, you you haven't stepped away long enough to be able to really reflect on it. But it would be interesting to say how did you think about the balance between kind of company centric things and the externalities that you needed to engage with in order for both the company and the patients and the customers to benefit. Yeah, look, you, you know, you're right. I think the um, at a high level, uh, Numar, I think the the role of the CEO has changed pretty dramatically over the last ten years. I mean, if you would have gone back to you know my predecessors, uh, and um, the level of engagement that was expected, not only with governments but frankly with employees on societal social issues, um, it's really evolved, uh, and um, and so I think the expectations about CEOs having a point of view on a broader array of topics has increased dramatically during that time frame. I think you have to be very thoughtful uh, because you're, you're not always, you're not just representing yourself, you're actually representing the organization. Uh, and, um, and, and look, you're, the, the, the line of you're never going to please everybody could not be more true. Uh, and, uh, and staying true to uh, your own personal beliefs, staying true to the, the ethos, the priorities of the company, uh, of recognizing where you can make a difference and perhaps where you can't uh, has become much more complex. Uh, but nonetheless, I think that's an expectation that people have of CEOs now. You know, in my case, uh, when I first went into the job, my, uh, my thinking was, look, for your first couple of years, basically keep your head down. And what I meant by that is make sure that you get grounded in your organization. There's a lot to learn as a new CEO. Even if you've spent your career, that job is unique. And the, the, again, the complexity, the scale, the, just the daily operations, um, I, I would always advise a new CEO to invest that time with your people, with customers, with your scientists, and really establish that grounding. You know, two, I think it's just important to, to demonstrate a certain level of competence and gain that confidence early on, you know, versus only being externally focused. And again, some of this can be impacted by exogenous events that you're dealing with, uh, but I thought it was important to get that grounding. That being said, after a certain number of years, in my case, it was probably like four or five years, I felt an obligation to get engaged in some of these other conversations where you knew that it was important for a company like a Johnson & Johnson to have a voice. Uh, you know, what you find is that more often than not, it's about educating and whether it's you know, working with legislators, politicians, other stakeholders of you know, making, pe making sure people understand. And so, look, some of these issues, again, whether it's science, reimbursement, policy, they're complex. Uh, they have a lot of different trade-offs. Uh, but what I found is if you're not out there engaging and helping to shape some of these things, then frankly, other forces will go in and do that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and like anything else, I also think it's important to build relationships with people so that you know, you're not only talking to that person the first time when there's a major problem, but in fact that there's a relationship of trust, of confidence, um, of, of one where, hey, there's confidence that I can rely on you, you know, for that information, and, and that's not done in a day. That can take years to establish, uh, you know, with, especially with uh, leaders around the world. Mm. Uh, so I think that was my approach, um, and, um, but I would, I would encourage, you know, other CEOs to think about it, but again, it can, it can be influenced based on a lot of other external sure. events as well. So we've been talking at both some, some like 1,000 foot level and 30,000 foot level in your role at J&J, but you also fly at 50,000 foot level, which is that you're on the boards of Apple and IBM and JP Morgan. Uh, and so that you know, and is an abstraction beyond just J&J, &J, uh, because you're, we're talking about three quite iconic market leading 
kind of enterprises with lots of differences, probably some similarities. If you take yourself to that purview, um, what are observations you could share that are outside of our industry in healthcare from these other companies about things that you've observed that you either think would be benefiting if they were, I don't mean just technology, but just the way they operate uh, and, and vice versa. So kind of what, what can we learn from your playing in that level uh, that affects our lives? Well, uh, hey, I'm, I'm really blessed to be, um, to be on the boards of, uh, of those three companies. And, um, you know, so whether it's kind of a business to business focus at IBM, a business to consumer focus with, uh, you know, a company like Apple, or frankly, just the sheer number of financial uh, transactions that a company like JP Morgan touches on a daily basis, and being able to participate and learn those discussions uh, is just a tremendous opportunity. And um, I, look, I would say that there's a couple themes um, that, would apply across all, you know, all these businesses. I think one is a, an appreciation of the impact that these companies actually have on society. And I think uh, you know, it's similar to the earlier discussion, while of course it's always a board's responsibility <clears throat> to be looking out for the financial performance uh, and, and how it's doing, you know, more and more what you find are you know, what are the other responsibilities uh, that you have to ha take into consideration, whether it's in, you know, ESG, the environment, other societal issues, gover governance issues, um, privacy issues, uh, and m you see those becoming topics of discussion uh, more and more, and making sure that the senior leadership teams uh, are prepared, uh, that not only that you have the right systems and processes, but frankly, that you're bringing um, the right culture to bear uh, is really important. Look, I think a lot of companies right now are looking at this post-COVID and new economic reality that we're facing into. Um, you know, I would say the largest percentage of organizations and leaders in business have not faced a higher inflation, higher interest rate, uh, more uncertainty around geopolitical uh, issue kind of environment that we're likely facing into right now. And, and how do we think about that um, you know, versus what we've done over the last decade or two and, and how might that impact our strategies and the way we think about you know, the, the businesses going forward. And I would say, look, another key theme is, um, is one of people. And I think the, even the expectations that people have now about their employers. And you know, it starts, one, with just work rhythm. Uh, I think all of us have probably been changed by what happened with COVID. Uh, and I think every company is dealing with this. Well, how do we, you know, what's our structure now? Are we going to go three days? Are we going to go four days? Are we going to go five days? Are we, are we going to be more remote? Are we going to do this? I think it depends on a lot of issues with the company, but I think that the contract has likely changed permanently. Uh, and, and I think every company is trying to make sure that how do, we, how do we do this in the right way where we maximize not only um, our effectiveness and our efficiency with employees, but also our engagement uh, and you know, the sense of trust that people have. I think you know, dealing with that, I think, the expectations about leadership that I mentioned earlier, about not only what a company does financially, but how does a company show up in other areas? Uh, and what kind of impact does that have on the relationship you know, with your employees long term? So I think those kind of themes I'm, I'm hearing, you know, and I, I, don't, I think it's probably similar in boardrooms around the world in trying to deal with some of those issues. Well, look, thanks again for the time. This is a great discussion. I think we can end on the highest of possible notes. And uh, thanks for the wisdom you've shared with us and uh, look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you very Thank much. You. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Well done. Thank you. Thank you.